morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Take a Stand. I'm your host, Tracy Wilson, and I'm joined today by the wonderful Susie Dent, and I'm going to share uh, some information about Susie in just a moment. But if you are tuning in for the very first time, and this is the first time you've been watching any of the Take a Stand series, then you need to know that show is all about providing you with inspiration, motivation, and heartfelt stories and secrets from women who have beaten the odds, who have overcome obstacles in their life, overcome adversity to create success in the areas of family, business, and life. And the fact that I've got Susie Dent here today is just a testament to the woman who she, that she is and the things that she has done in her life to get to the point that she's at right now. She's going to share all of her story. She's also going to uncover how a 12-year-old girl actually helped her overcome about four decades of what we're going to call misguided self-beliefs that actually had her held back in so many areas of her life. And I know that this story that she's going to tell today will resonate with so many other women. So I want you to listen really carefully. I want you to listen to the 12, when she starts talking about the 12-year-old girl, what it was that this young girl did and how she then was able to overcome the four decades of misguided conversations, narratives that were going on in her head to create success in her life. I also want to let you know that Susie is a renowned uh, makeup artist. She's a she's a very special person. I'm going to say if you don't, if you have seen any of the leukemia ads uh, that were running for a long, long time in Australia, well, Susie is actually extremely talented in the makeup artistry space. She is also a special effects artist, and she was actually responsible for the chins. So if you saw those on the leukemia ads, well, that is all Susie Dent. That is all her work. Aside from being an amazing makeup artist, and I'm going to say amazing because she did my makeup too within a number of shoots that I've had and made me look really good. So thank you, Susie, uh, and which I use in a lot of my promos. So if you're wondering who did my makeup, well, this is the woman who did it. Uh, also, Susie has also been instrumental in really helping women to understand who they are. She is a, the epitome of somebody who is you know, stands up for herself, stands firm on her beliefs, and then has moved forward in making sure that in every area of her life, she's taken control and she's now, you know, being extremely successful. She's also been one of the women, if you remember uh, the story, and it goes back a few years, with Rolf Harris, who was a very uh, influential man in the entertainment industry. So Susie's been in that industry too for a long, long time. So she was one of the women that actually helped bring justice to for so many other women who were impacted by the actions of that particular man. So I want to welcome her to the show today. Um, you're going to see a lot and lots of Susie over the next over the coming weeks. She may even uh, share with us some of that stuff. And uh, I want to talk with her about her history, you know, really about what's gone on. And I want to get to know this 12-year-old girl that you were talking about, that you were telling me about, that really had an influential um, or a profound impact on your life and has really got you to the point that you're at today. So welcome to the show, Susie. Thank you so much, Tracy. Wow, what a huge welcome. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm so <laughs> pleased to be here. I thought I've got to, I'm so glad you're recording. I have to write that down. That's the, like the best. Well, we'll, well, we'll have it recorded, so it's all there ready for you to, you to watch Yay. it again. So I want to know, like, let's go back to the Susie, like the young girl Susie. And like this show, Susie, is often, you know, the book that I wrote uh, along with Vicky Helm, the co-author, The she -Myth. In fact, my copy arrived yesterday. So guys, here's a copy of The she -Myth book. So this series has actually come as a result of writing The she -Myth book and then me starting to interview women all over the world about their she -Myth story. And when... Um, Anyway, when I wrote the book and I started thinking about how do I help women overcome some of these she myths that we continue to layer on top of ourselves on a regular basis, how do I bring that to light, get women at, from all levels and all ages to understand that often it's just a big fat she myth that you're dealing with and how you can overcome them. So I asked Susie to be here today and I want to go back to like your early years, Suze. Tell us about your upbringing and, uh, you know, some of the things that you had dreamed of doing but didn't really do because of outside influence. Hi. Um, 
I was raised um, in a very spiritual family. So I was raised by a father who was a Sunday school teacher. My mother was captain of the girls brigade. I was raised with praying in the Bible, um, no swearing. Um, I got over that one. Um, no, <laughs> uh, and uh, very, very strict. I was in a very strict moral upbringing. Um, I was raised um, very strictly uh, with a strict dress code as well. Um, so, and back in those days, uh, you know, brass straps weren't seen or anything like that. Everything had to be tucked away. So I, I never showed, you know, well, I never learned to show my cleavage or anything like that, but that, that was something that uh, happened to me when I was earlier. So you want to take me back to my 12 year old girl. Let's talk about not my 12 year old girl, my little girl when I was younger. So she was a, she was a God fearing Christian. Um, I went round and door knocked on people's houses and asking them if they'd gone, if they'd turned to Christ, that sort of stuff, full on stuff, you know. I was also really feisty uh, and um, wanted to be and very independent. So um, I had my first job uh, when I was 12. I worked uh, on a farm uh, down in Sydney. I'm from Sydney originally. I worked on a farm uh, on Sundays doing gardening and weeding and stuff. And on Saturday mornings, I would go, they'd come and pick me up at 2.30 in the morning, the Italian farmer, uh, his two teenage sons and my friend who was a year older than me. And we would go to the markets and we'd sell fruit and vegetables all Saturday at Flemington Markets, which in Sydney is like a huge market. It was amazing. I loved it. You know, I, I like the smell of blood and bone. I know that's a bit weird. But I know that I like the outside stuff. I really enjoyed the selling. At 12, I so enjoyed being independent. I was earning a little bit of money. My parents were fine. Um, but I don't think they could stop me now. I know who I am as a person. I think I was fairly independent and was like, I'm doing it. So, uh, which was great. I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, then uh, from there, I, I, I did other jobs. I worked at McDonald's, went to high school, you know, did the usual thing. What I wanted to be all through high school, because back in uh, the 70s, there weren't very many opportunities for women. Right? So women couldn't be doctors or dentists or lawyers. We couldn't be that. Uh, so uh, when I was in high school, there was a drive to, uh, to the bank. So women got to get jobs in the bank. Halfway through high school, you did a test. You did your maths, you did your English, you knew if you had a job in the bank before you'd finished. I'm sure there's lots of women out there nodding their head going, oh, I did that test. I worked at the bank when I finished school. It was very common in Australia. It was back in the 70s, they, all the branches were starting to happen. So the huge drive and, and a great job for women, really. Uh, and I didn't get into uni because I just that was an academic. I was sporty, really good at sport and just kind of just struggled through classes and was a sporting star. So I got to stay out of some classes and study at the library. Uh, the joys of being a, a sporty person. Um, uh, and I wanted to be an air hostess. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be an air hostess because it looked like so much fun. Uh, but uh, when I was 19, I was in a different place and I went for the interview and stuffed it because uh, I had a scar on my foot and I was just, I, I didn't have the self-confidence that I needed, to be quite honest. And back then, uh, part of being an air hostess, not a flight attendant, was having your bum pinched because that's what life was like for women back then. And it was actually a prerequisite of the job. Um, and I hadn't learned to be that mouthy yet, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to tolerate having my bum pinched and that I would be really mouthy on the plane. And that would kind of be, you know, it was counterindicative to having a good job. So it was kind of good that they didn't get me, you know, I didn't get that job. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, then I, I realised there was such a thing as a makeup artist when I was 21 after I'd finished school when I was in Europe. Oh, sorry, when I was 20. And uh, then uh, I told my parents, I have, I have dual nationality, they'll either, either stay in Britain and study or uh, I'll come home. To Australia, so my father found me the one and only school that was a makeup college called Three Arts Makeup Centre in Chippendale, and uh, he applied for me, and uh, I got in because I'd done a whole lot of stuff as a child. I've done all my Duke of Edinburgh awards and all these sort of things. So I was a high achieving child. So I've always been a high achieving child, a time and a person. So uh, he he got me in. It was very small. I realised as soon as I went there that I was exactly where I should be, and that I was so uh, into being a makeup artist. And that's where I discovered my skills and my talents as a makeup artist and, and as a salesperson as I went forward in life. You know, so that's kind of what I did in the beginning. And I've been a makeup artist now in film and television since 1983. Uh, I'm in my 37th year. Last November I was honoured uh, by in the United States and I, and I was given a Lifetime Achievement Award, which was amazing. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's kind of my, my, my history. And I'm still working as a makeup artist and now I work as a motivational speaker and a funny MC. Uh, and um, I, I don't like to call myself a coach or a life coach because it doesn't really fit with who I am, but I do do that uh, and I do that with women and, and I have done it my whole time, my whole career. You know what it's like. You sit in a hairdresser's chair or a makeup artist's chair and you want to talk to us 
And uh, so I've been helping people. I've been building my uh, people's self-esteem with my brushes and my words for 37 years. So I don't know if that makes me a coach, but I'll tell you what, you know what it's like when you sit in the hairdresser's chair, you tell her everything. She knows everything about you. And I do hair as well as makeup. So I usually have a little wrapped up little bow and I love, I love that part of my job, not just the painting, but the, um, the helping people with their lives, which is wonderful. And so, so with your, obviously with that um, really extensive background and starting out in, you know, a job really young and sort of working your way through and kind of finding your way, but coming from a really um, strict upbringing, what sort of, you know, what sort of impact did that have on you, particularly in the workplace? Because, you know, like I was talking with somebody else a little bit earlier this morning about how, you know, we think, oh, how times have changed. You know, back in the 70s, you know, you had to, there was just such very strict protocol that strict upbringing that you had kind of seeped over into you into the workplace there were certain things that you had to do in a certain way wear certain things so tell us a little bit about um you know those early days particularly in the the, the banking industry when things were just so when women had to do things in a just a certain way like being an air hostess come with it was you had to get your, your butt pinched and if you didn't like it well this wasn't the job for you whereas nowadays you know someone is here is saying i'm laughing because uh where is it i'm laughing because i punched and dropped the boss uh to the ground when he pinched my bum unexpected unexpectedly so you know that that sort of stuff would be what because it's totally unacceptable now it was totally inappropriate back then but somehow it was acceptable right it was kind of like well if you didn't you know what like it, I think it was it acceptable. we just had to deal with it we had yeah. to grin and bear it so along the lines of that lovely lady who just posted something when i worked in the bank ladies and gentlemen um the banks had uh, so this was 19 finished i finished year 12 in 1979 which was sixth form uh, and i started working in the bank so i was literally 17 turned 18 Right, when I when I started work, um, they had a little a little navy blue uniform with a zipper that was a mini skirt. The accountant blucked, looking at my legs and my body in that, and he liked me to wear to make him coffees. Right, um, I also wasn't allowed. I was allowed to wear the trousers that were the other part of the uniform because the accountant liked to look at my at my legs. Right, so one day I wore the trousers, not really understanding what this was because I was a teenager, um, and I was sent home by the accountant to put my dress on. The other girls could wear trousers, but I could not because he liked to look at me and he liked me to make him coffee. So I didn't know any better. I went home, I got changed and I came back. Um, around the same sort of time, I was also working in, in another place, which was called, uh, I think that, not even open now, the Black Stump Restaurant. I'm sure there's people that remember the Black Stump with the sizzling steaks and the prawns wrapped in bacon. Yum. I worked there as well, and uh, that uh, that uniform there had a dress that um, had it was kind of like uh, below the knee, but they had slits to halfway, you know, up the leg, right on both sides and pockets. So I, um, with this guy, the the bank manager, the accountant. So the accountant liked to look at my legs. The bank manager, or the assistant bank manager, he locked me in the safe one day so he could run his hands all over my body and trapped me in there, this married guy. Um, uh, they both assaulted me pretty much. Well, he did. I, I didn't have, you didn't have any comeback back then. You couldn't slap them off. You couldn't tell them to F off. I wasn't allowed to swear. Mind you, I, I learned that later on. Um, and you didn't, you weren't allowed to. It was a job that was on the line. There wasn't, it was like, okay, this guy's going to fill me up. I'm trapped in a safe. Uh, where do I go? I stand here, he does his stuff, you know, uh, I push him away, hopefully, and he gets embarrassed and we leave the safe, yay, and that's kind of what happened. And it's never spoken about. In this day and age, I'd get him sacked. He'd be so sacked, right? So yeah. he'd be so gone, I'd have his career. But back then they would have our job and we were tellers, we didn't count, you know, and even then you can only, you, that's all you could get high to. You could aspire to be teller A. You couldn't be an accountant. You couldn't be a bank manager. Women just couldn't do anything like that. The, the glass ceiling was chopping us off at the neck, really, and decapitating yeah. all of us, you know. Um, so, so I had that happening at the bank, which is a bit disconcerting. Well, the Black Stump Restaurant, the manager there, he liked to rip my dress to the waist. Uh, so he'd call me into the office with the coffee. They both liked my legs and they both liked the coffee. And he would literally rip my dress to the waist, both sides, right, and I'd stand there and I'd get the stapler off his desk and I'd staple my dress, ka-ching, 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 all the way back down and I'd stand there and go, you're done? And he'd be like, yeah, he said, you have to sew it. And I'd go, Phew. and I'd go in the next night for the next shift and he'd say, have you sewn your dress? And I'd go, no, and he would rip it to the waist again. I'd give him his coffee, you know, 
and I'd staple my dress. So um, this is this is me at 18 and 19 learning about men in the workforce. It's great. It was really, you know, wasn't happening to everybody. What was happening to me was pretty exclusive to me back then um, in the environment that I was in. But I know that this sort of stuff happened to lots of women in lots of different work environments. Um, so how did I handle it? Right, at 19. Mm-hmm. Well, A, I am um, at the bank, I hired, uh, there was no dress code as far as the size of the dresses or the length. So I got other dresses and I got them three sizes too big and I didn't hem them. So they were huge. I wore a sack and he would say nothing. So at 19, I learned to cover my body up so men wouldn't be so distracted by it because obviously it was my fault. And I was I was often told that it was my fault. If I didn't look the way I looked, right, um, they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be so uh, compelled to touch me, which was the excuse back then, not an excuse now because we'll just cut their fingers off. So uh, the bank, so what happened back then? How did I, how else did I do it? I, all of a sudden, one week I acquired a cockroach. It was a rubber cockroach, right? I was a bit done with making coffee for these men. And I got this rubber cockroach. It was a big one. In Australia, we have big German cockroaches right, sat right at the bottom of the coffee cup. And the coffee covered it all up. So the accountant, got he got it first. The screams of horror coming from him when he got to the bottom of the coffee cup with a, what looked like an extremely real cockroach were just the best thing ever. Awesome. Uh, so I managed to uh, retrieve the cup and the cockroach because I didn't tell him I did it. And he didn't, he didn't touch it to know that it was rubber. However, uh, I managed to use the same thing on the bank, on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the the restaurant manager as well in the very same week. Uh, he too was absolutely horrified. He chucked the cockroach. I had a blast, uh, got my own back and um, uh, got away with wearing that really big uniform for the rest of my time at the bank. And uh, even though I still wasn't allowed to wear trousers, but I didn't really need to because I looked awful. And uh, the... Uh, the guy in the, in the restaurant, the manager stopped ripping my dress and neither of them asked me to make them a coffee again. Just nice. I mean, what a giggle. It's, it's so, I could love to have been a fly on the wall watching that guy drink that coffee and just almost spilling it everywhere. It would have been just hilarious. Uh, it was you, awesome. <laughs> What what happens, right, is that we have all of these things going on. Like, you know, you realize you saw it. This was a pattern. This is happening here. It's happening there. What the heck? Well, well, now I'm going to do something about it. But what we tend to do is we kind of, instead of at that time not being able to address it because of the ramifications that that would have caused, you know, loss of your job and all those sorts of things, we found workarounds and we constantly, you know, we continue to this day to find workarounds when we don't have the confidence to be able to deal with the situation at hand. We don't know what to do. We don't have the confidence to deal with it. We don't know what our rights are. We don't know how if we're supported. And we you think you're alone. So, you it know, kind of yeah. yeah, you know, really back then there was no H&R department. There was nowhere you could go. Everything was run by men. Men didn't care. They even, I complained about something once and they got the, the bank got the, the big guy from uh, from Sydney to come and see me, right? They took him out to lunch. They got him pissed. The man could not string a sentence together when it was my turn to speak to him. And so it was completely useless. He came for a lunch and he went. He certainly didn't hear me out because he was incapable of doing it. That's how much respect I had as a 19-year-old. They didn't care. They went through the motions. Good for them. So it was all on record. But that nothing came out of it. <laughs> nothing really happened. I mean, one of our viewers is also saying it's not only confidence, but it's also, you know, you get to the point where you just don't have the energy to deal with it because it because of the enormity of what it takes, you know, or what you perceive it's going to take to actually deal with a situation like that just becomes overwhelming. And we're going to get to this because um, as the, the, the plot thickens, people, so just hang around because there is more to this as to how this all unfolds. And it really did um, come to a head at one point. So don't go anywhere. You want to stick around because we're going to get to that. So, Suze, once all of all of that happened, obviously you found these workarounds and what happened? Like, how impactful were those situations that happened way back then? How impactful were they on your your life, like for for decades? They were really impactful because um, I was really, and it didn't just happen there. It happened. Uh, 
when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I really felt, and I really did not think I was particularly pretty, right? That's not how I was raised in my house. Right? My mother my mother was a narcissist. She she had jealous, full-on jealousy issues. So I did not think I was special. I didn't think I was pretty. But I was getting attention that was completely unwarranted and unwanted. I didn't dress in any way provocatively at all because I was a tomboy um, and uh, I, I covered my body and dressed down, but I still felt, like uh, I had this neon sign over my head that said, touch me, touch me. And they did, you know, uh, because men did back then. It was like, oh, there's a pretty bright, shiny thing. Let's touch her. Even working, uh, so I started working in the television industry uh, when I was, uh, so I was 21, 22. Um, and the television industry was really good as far as uh, crew were concerned right, because it's very equal opportunity. It's also a male-dominated industry and still is, actually. Mm -hmm. There's only parts of it that is not male-dominated. If you walk onto a, a TV set, you might see maybe three women, if you're lucky, and the rest of it uh, will be men. So it is a male-dominated industry. Um, but I was really comfortable there uh, because I was treated I was treated well. And, and if they were fancying me, they certainly didn't tell me, you know. I mean, back then, as women, we couldn't go to mechanics, right? Mechanics, you go to a mechanic as a woman and you were met with full frontal girly pictures all over the walls, pornography everywhere. I hated going to a mechanic, just digress there. I'm sure there's women that remember this, you know, uh, and it's pertinent because we got rid of that, right? You can now go safely to a mechanic that you won't find full frontal nudity in any mechanics anywhere in Australia that I know of because if they, you know, well, it just doesn't happen. But when I was young and a young woman and I had my first car, I would get my mates, my male mates, to take my car to the mechanics because it was so intimidating. Um, and now that doesn't happen, you know. So it takes a little while for society to catch up with things or actually it takes a little while for society to catch up with what women don't want and what we don't like when we finally get around to getting rid of all the baggage that we've been carrying around and stand up for ourselves and speak our minds like we're doing now, uh, that's how change happens. Men don't know and society doesn't know if we don't tell them. And I'm all about telling, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? And so back then it, it was, you know, I, I did, I changed how I dressed. I covered my body. I covered my body up and I did tend to move through life a bit a bit easier that way. I also, and I won't just make it all about men, I had women who were jealous of me. Um, I had my mother, I dressed down for my mother because it made it easier to spend any time with her. I wouldn't wear mascara and I'm really blonde so I look as plain as I could make myself. I would cover my legs up so she wouldn't mention them all the time. And back then women would be like, the things women would say was like, "Ye be, I hate you. Your legs are great, you know." So it was like this insulting thing that women would say to you. And for me, because I think raised by a jealous mother, um, I was so conscious that it was really my fault the way I looked, and it made me feel so bad that people around me were jealous and envious and of but what I look like. They didn't know me who I was, but it was painful and it hurt me because I'm sensitive, I guess, and because of the way I was raised. So by covering myself up, I protected other people and I hid myself because somehow when I let my light shine brightly, it wasn't good for everybody else. And I'd been so raised to shut up and stay down and, you know, and not be the person that I was actually meant to be. Um, and that actually gets back to when I was uh, very, very young in my first job, if you would like to me to take it there, Tracy. Um, I had, uh, I had um, a really bad experience um, and I was sexually molested at that job that I was at. And the thing is, you know what? It wasn't in the whole grand scheme of sexual assault ladies. Uh, it really wasn't that big a deal. I wasn't raped. I wasn't penetrated. I was stuck in a tent with a dirty old man who stuck his hand down my shirt underneath my little purple training bra and groped my breast and rumped his old, dirty, gnarly, dry old fingers over my breast, right? And then uh, he gave me my pay. I think it was probably the longest five minutes I've ever spent. I was completely paralysed with shock and I was 12. And uh, the, uh, it, yeah, got out of there as soon as I could. He gave me my pay and gave me a tip. So the Sunday school going me had just turned into a prostitute and she wasn't even wearing a proper bra yet because she wasn't even fully developed. And I was not raised with talks about sex or anything like that. Uh, that just, you know, that was a lot of hang-ups in my house 
that I, you know, had to wade through as an adult and realised how uh, hung up my parents were and how naive they were and how sheltered and, you know, all the rest. And, um, yeah. you know, a lot of us were brought up like that. So I, I had this... Um, this self-loathing of my body from what happened to me when I was 12. And as I matured and as my physical body grew and I come from a booby family, um, I grew the double Ds that I hated with a passion. Um, I would um, strap myself down, wear, wear two bras and aerobic crop tops, try and make my boobs as small as I possibly could. I hated my breasts so much um, when I eventually did, uh, because of what happened to me, when I eventually did... Um, uh, start having sex at, you know, 18 or whatever, 19, 18. Um, it was never without a T-shirt on. I didn't like them so no, was, no one else was going to like them. And I like having sex, uh, you know, healthy girl, apart from this self-hatred of a certain part of my body, you know. And that I carried with me for a really long time, that moment when I was 12. And I bring it up because we're seeing a lot of um, incidences now of women coming forward in the Me Too movement with historical cases. Uh, and then they get judged in society by those who should keep their mouths shut on their keyboards. Um, and we're judged and found wanting because something happened to us in the past. And the thing is, is what happens to us in our past when we are at this delicate phase and we're not really sexual yet and we're young and we're babies and we're new and we're naive, it carries with us our whole lives. For me, it changed, it intrinsically changed who I was, how I felt about myself, how I felt about my body, my intimate relationship, how I responded to boys, to men. It was all changed because of this one moment with this man. And like I said, it doesn't feel much in the grand scheme of things, you know, just having a bit of a boob grope. But I tell you what, it really is. Um, and things can happen to us that we carry and we carry and we carry. Uh, and unless we deal with them and we forgive ourselves for how we feel and we bring it all out on a plate and learn about who we are, what happened, who was to blame, how we deal with that, how we forgive them and move forwards, you know, it affects us so much in our lives, you know. When, um, yes. Ab absolutely. I mean, you know, that that whole, you know, instance and um, unfortunately, I'm sorry that happened to you, Susie, but, you know, unfortunately it too, it's not an isolated case. You know, it happens often. We're hearing these stories over and over and over again and often women don't know how to um, forgive, them, you know, forgive themselves, let it go, and they continue to carry that with them for for a very very long time so i want to um i want to also now talk about because there's been a few like i know of two other major instances in your life where they have like you've kind of got to a point where we've hung on to this for far too long and i need to do something about this and there were some other instances that happened and like you alluded to you know often we sort of dismiss things because well that was like years ago what's wrong with you why are you still dwelling on that now like that was 40 years ago why haven't you dealt with that um and often and we don't because we don't know how to deal with that so what was the moment in time where you were like do you know what I've been carrying this for long enough and it's time to let it go. What did you do and how did you let that go that enabled you to, and what did you do next? What was the next thing that actually happened? Because I know there was something big. <laughs> You're right, a couple of big things. Um, in 2014, I was at home and I was watching A Current Affair on TV and I saw this woman being interviewed uh, her name was Tonya, and she was talking about um, being assaulted by Rolf Harris when she was a 15-year-old girl. And I'm watching this show and I'm watching this program and I had heard she'd already been in the newspapers. She had a big PR agent who had completely shafted her and thrown her to the press, taken her money, ripped her off and thrown her to the press. And I was watching this woman and I thought, I know that you're not lying because I too was assaulted by Rolf Harris when I was 24 in 1986. And I know that I can, I can help you and I can come forward. And when I was watching this woman, her 15-year-old, talking about her 15-year-old girl, the 12-year-old girl inside me who never told a soul, who had her life completely changed, is just going, right, I'm in. I'm coming forward. My 12-year-old's coming for your 15-year-old. I'm here, you and me. We're like this. And I, um, I approached the, uh, I watched the show. I Googled 
and to find out what um, I, I knew it was called Operation New Tree. I Googled where I should find to tell them that I'd worked with uh, the police over in England, that I'd worked with Rolf Harris, and um, I found them. And I approached them and I sent them an email. And uh, within um, two days, I got my first phone call. Now, what happened with me in 1986 is I, um, it was the beginning, of, I think, year three of my film and television career. I was working, I was booked for a job at Channel 7 Studios in Epping. Knew I was working with Rolf Harris, which is amazing. He was like the biggest star I'd ever worked with. Um, it was huge. So, was, you know, the, the fun with working in film and television is working with the stars, you know, obviously. Working with normal people is fun, but, you know, you get to meet, you get to meet mega millionaire stars. I mean, it's pretty cool. And you make them up and you have your own private moments. It's great. I'd watched Rolf Harris as I was a kid um, in black and white TV, you know, doing the wobble board and the art and, you know, he was a children's entertainer and, you know, pretty pretty cool, seemed, you know, seemed cool. He um, he arrived at the studios, was given the red carpet treatment uh, by the powers that be. Um, I was introduced to him and uh, with, the, with the rest of the crew who are all guys and I uh, took him into my makeup room. Uh, now we had a private makeup room, so pretty much almost like the size of this. I'd be he'd be like sitting where I am, and there'd be a mirror in front of him on a kind of a barber's chair, an old-fashioned barber's chair. And the room really only went to oh, this side, only went to about you know so far. So this would be like where the door was, and then over this side, um, probably a wardrobe rack. So not a very big room, just enough place for maybe you know an ironing board uh, and uh, somewhere to sit and get dressed and get made up. So he's sitting in my chair. Uh, when you first make someone up, you have to touch their skin to see, you know, whether it's dry, normal, or oily, uh, you know, and I'm touching it. As a makeup artist, we invade people's space. You've got to be the right person to do that. Um, part of my 37-year career is my great psychology skills. I've worked with four prime ministers, you know. It's all about how you make people feel before they go on camera. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, checking a Rolf's face and um, he's got his brother standing, sorry, this side, at the door like uh, having a chat to him. And while I was checking his face, he drops his arm, his right arm, down down the side of the chair and sticks it up my leg and runs it all up my leg up the side of my shorts like this. And I'm standing there thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, and he was quiet. He said nothing, still carried on conversation with his brother. And I'm looking at this man while he's got his hand up my shorts, right, because my shorts are baggy and... Uh, which they were kind of back then, the old and, and with a rip in it that where, when the rips first started in 1986, you know. Um, and I just stood there. I looked into his into his eyes, and um, he wasn't the jovial uh, children's entertainer that I thought he was. He was a dirty old man having a really nice time at my expense, almost daring me to say something. And back then, you couldn't. And I turned around and I looked in the mirror while he was talking to his brother, and I just thought. Oh my God, I can't believe you work with kids. Like, seriously, you know? Anyway, I turned right back around and I did my job and I took him into the studio where the male director was there and he's about the same age as Rolf. Um, and they then just started to talk about my legs and my body whilst I'm, you know, being a professional. So this is my job, you know, this is my workplace. I'm not actually there to be an object of um, anything for anybody, but that's what I became because we're in 1986 and we've already established that women don't have any rights. And if you are attractive, you have to stand there and let them touch you because um, the number one rule in my job is uh, you don't upset the talent, right? So he's running his hands up and down my leg. I'm standing there thinking that him and the director, I think he's about 63 at the time and I'm 24, so he's old, right? Um, and I'm thinking the director and him have just got the whole, the casting couch is alive and well inside their brains, you know. They've got some sort of wicked fantasy going on. As sometimes, uh, you know, men did back then with Hollywood and stuff, but, so I copped it because you do and I smile and I'm nice and all that sort of stuff and I do what I'm supposed to do, I powder his nose and blot the sweat off and go and stand where I'm supposed to stand and I don't talk back and I don't smart mouth and I'm just treating the men like they're, you know, naughty little boys because that's what we're supposed to do. Oh, dear, you've run your hand on my bottom. Best you shouldn't do that again because that's how we had to behave. We had no choice. Now, if I had said anything, even though I've established that we couldn't actually speak like that back then, pushed him away or been aggressive at all, whenever you did say anything, I was blamed for what I looked like. It was always reverse psychology back onto me going, if you didn't look like this, I wouldn't be so inclined to touch you. It's not my fault. It's your fault. So this whole narrative that I've been going through my life with, not actually feeling particularly picked particularly pretty but being told that <laughs> it was my problem so I learned you know I knew I couldn't talk couldn't say anything 
Um, so um, I did my job each time I went to touch up Rolf, he touched me up too. It started, he would have, um, in the, uh, I think the shoot was probably about six hours, maybe a bit longer. So it was a short day actually, in the whole grand scheme of things. Um, he would have touched me two dozen times. Um, I was starting to get really done with it. We skipped lunch so he could go early, which was good, which is why we, we worked through. Um, there was two younger guys um, in the studio with me. I, um, I started waiting at the back of the studio and he would still call for me, make up, you know. Uh, and then I waited outside because I was really getting done with it. I was really sick of him touching me. And then if he, they needed me, one of the younger guys would come outside and get me. And I'd go into the studio and I'd do what I have to do and he'd fill me up. I had a, a belt, like a leather belt, which is like a long belt that draped down. He would grab the belt and he'd pull me towards him so I could try and crotch grind me. I had a, a, a rip in uh, the, uh, the right leg, uh, kind of, you know, halfway up my leg, not big enough to get your hand through, but Jeezy tried, you know, so I'd grab his hand, you know. So bear in mind, I've got a tissue box in one hand and stuff in the other, so I'd have to hold it, stop, and I'd go, don't do that, you'll rip my shorts, Let's just try and pull the fingers out of my shorts and pop your hand by his side. There, there, let's just pat your nose, for God's sake, you know. So at the end of the end of every shoot, so this is what I went, well, this is what I went, at the end of the day, I was pretty pissed off, let's just say. I was really done with being touched and groped all day by this dirty old man who took carte blanche and had a great time. I was in a studio with my work colleagues who were all men who all stood around and watched and said nothing whatsoever because that's what it was like for women. We didn't have protection of men. That Men were either too scared, didn't care, and that's just what was happening or would have liked to have touched you themselves. And that's what it felt like. And that's what it always felt like. You know, you know that there was moment. always a line that would want to touch you. If one touched you, someone else would. You still have to stand there and let them. You know. Okay. So I said, at the end of the day, part of a job as a, as a makeup artist is to take off the makeup. And back then it was video, right? So really bright lights, really loud air conditioning. So the air conditioning had to come off before each take. The lights were really bright, so it was so hot in there. Like you know, really, um, you could only last for a, you know. If you, not not that long before it was time to blot the sweat again. And so at the end of the day, there was no way I was going to go back into my tiny little makeup room and take off his makeup. There's no way I was going to be in a room with that man alone again. No way, no how. Uh, so outside the studio was, um, in the corridor, was um, a cupboard that had all the janitor supplies. It was a cleaning cupboard. So it was a little cupboard with brooms and stuff in. So I snuck in there. Um, and I could open the door a little bit and look down the corridor. So when he left, he was kind of hovering outside where my makeup room was. And I'm like, yeah, you can wait as long as you like, mate. Uh, and I kept looking. And then um, the powers that be, all the men that ran the studio came downstairs and, you know, coaxed him down and took him off and off, off he went on his little red carpet wherever they took him. Um, I, uh, I went into the makeup, the, the, the makeup studio the, uh, and spoke to the woman who was in charge there who I actually knew and I told her I'd had a disgusting day and being um, felt up and groped by a, the dirty old man all day and she said to me, oh, I thought you knew. His nickname is the octopus. He targets makeup artists all across the country wherever he works mm -hmm. uh, and he's known in the industry for, for groping makeup artists. And I'm like, well, no, I didn't know and it would have been nice to have had a heads up. And then she tells me, she gives me a message from upstairs. Um, I'd been uh, told um, uh, to uh, commend me on how I'd behave and how I'd conducted myself with Rob Harris. Right? And I'm standing there thinking, but I've only just complained. Right? So then I realised that all the powers would be able, upstairs in the control room watching the whole thing. So there could have been, you know, I don't know, 10, 12 men having a really nice time watching Ralph grope me all day. Right, uh, and that welcome to the eighties, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. That's what it was like. So you know, he left. Um, I uh, that night, I I told everybody. I told every man his dog. You know, my parents knew, my best mates knew. Um, for the rest of my career, um, well, actually, for the rest of my life, no man ever, from that day forward, ever touched me again without my invitation. I became so mouthy. My, I could swear better than a sailor back then, I tell you. Um, I learnt to be very, very mouthy. I learnt that having a sweet-looking face and a really disgusting mouth <laughs> was a really good put-off and turn-off for men that wanted to touch me. Um, you know, I learnt to be more, a lot more, not physically aggressive but a lot more assertive um, mm -hmm. and making sure that, that I didn't make eye contact. You know, I still changed how I behaved, though. As you have said, yes. we change, we adapt, I adapted. I still wore baggy clothes and baggy T-shirts for ever and ever and ever because it was still my protection, 
my psychological protection. Um, I, uh, for the rest of my career, whenever I'm often asked, because I work with lots of stars, you know, who's the best person you work with and who's the worst? The best person would change depending on who I'd played with, you know, recently, you know. The worst person was always him, always. Mm -hmm. I knew without a shadow of doubt I would never work with that man again. There's only a couple of people in my entire career that involved that could involve directors and photographers and you know other people that I might ever, not ever work with. But him, absolutely, that was an unsafe person. That's why I wasn't going to go in that room with him again. Um, you know, and so when I'm so in 2014, when I'm watching the current affair and I'm seeing this woman talking about her 15 year old girl who was molested, my 12 year old jumped up and went, "Enough is enough." Right. You are not going to be quiet this time. I had no choice. I was catapulted forward. I didn't even speak to anybody. I was literally, as soon as the show was finished, I'm, I'm Googling. Uh, it was a complete no-brainer for me. It, it was, I was so driven by my 12-year-old girl. I was um, really lucky. I was chosen by the judge to be part of the court case. Um, I was called a bad character witness. Um, I was the oldest um sexual assault victim. I never thought of myself as being sexually assaulted because as women back then, that actually wasn't sexually assault. We were just being groped. So, you know, it's a grey line, you know, unless, you know, you actually only really assaulted if you were actually raped uh, back then. So, and we had nowhere to go. You couldn't tell anybody. Uh, the police would just laugh at you or, you know, try and come feel. Oh, no, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> the police, you, you had nothing, right? There, there wasn't the understanding in the, and it, actually in the police department at that there is now. Um, the police that uh, started the case with Rolf Harris were amazing. Operation New Tree, the, the, the men and women who were part of that operation, which included England and here in Australia, you know, they, they sent police out from Britain to interview my friends of 35 years ago to speak to them about their memory of what I told them of that day. We all took it very seriously. My friends all, who were my family, all backed me. I told them all what I was doing and they all backed me 100%. Um, uh, I, it, was, uh, it was, I was on this kind of journey that I wasn't going to stop, uh, that I, I came forward. I didn't come forward for me. I came forward for the women that were little girls. And as the case went on and I was chosen to be part of this case, I was also kept into the in the loop. Many, many women came forward, dozens of women came forward from all over the world. There were so many of us for the first case. I was chosen because um, Consolidated Press um, in, in the UK wanted to, they wanted uh, the names of the bad character witnesses, which was me and another five other people. Um, I was uh, asked to write a, an, a letter to the judge about how I felt about that, if I would still come forward, if I wasn't given lifetime anonymity, which was promised me in the beginning, not why I came forward, but it was a bonus. Um, and I said to the judge that, uh, that if he felt that it was okay, uh, to drag my name through the press and put my name out there so I would be assaulted, uh, you know, and uh, like by the keyboard warriors and, and all the people that were going to judge me and the millions around the world who are in absolute disbelief that Rolf Harris could possibly touch a little girl or anybody for that matter, um, that I was fine with it and I was still going to come forward because as far as I was concerned, if I didn't come forward, then these women were being uh, uh, abused and assaulted all over again. And you know what? I was I was chosen for that, which was great. And I'm in the courtroom and my 12-year-old girl was with the 15-year-old girl, the 14-year-old girl, the 9-year-old and the 11-year-old. And we were there in court in England together, women from around the world with our, with our children inside us that wouldn't let us be quiet this time. And we won our court case. And even though we never met each other, the, we were unified in what we were doing in our support for each other as women and as victims of this man and of women who had been intrinsically changed as you young people by the actions of this man. Um, after the court case was over, um, I refused to be, um, I was given anonymity. I was, I was still, I was found this day two of the case by the BBC. I was hounded by a producer to be uh, on a show. They were going to blank out my face. They were going to change my accent. Because I've worked in film and television, I know what happens? I, you know, I have the knowledge. I understand. I had, I had the federal police here. I had the phone numbers of them in case my name was leaked. My child was twelve. I didn't want the press turning up on the doorstep. My husband was, um, ha was full on depressed back then. He was having anxiety attacks. You know, it was full on. I did what I had to do for life, because uh, if we don't come forward and stand up for other people, then what sort of people are we? And I would have been a complete hypocrite. And I just, it's not who I am as a human being. I couldn't do that. Uh, so. 
that's what happened in 2014 when I was in England. I was support, I was brought over by the police. They paid for everything, the prosecution, um, the press, being at, reading the press about yourself is the most surreal experience when you've got, there was England, Australia, Malta, New Zealand, um, Europe, Australia, every day there was news every day. It was on the on the news, in the papers, everywhere. And everything that I said in the courtroom and beforehand was part of public record. Uh, so the nameless, faceless me was being quoted all over the place and it's weird, let me tell you. I had my girlfriend with me. She was my um, chaperone, which was great and I really needed her. She's been in my life for you know, 37 years. Uh, it's really important to have family with you when these things happened. Um, I... Um, my favourite headline about me was um, uh, Australian television makeup artist dramatically stares down Rolf Harris in court. I'm like, yeah, I did that. That was me because that's what I did. I was in court. I did everything that I had to do. It was it was, it was amazing. The, the policeman, my liaison, said, don't look at him. And I'm like, oh, mate, you sure I can't walk past him. Did this? Go, no, he says he don't. Like, okay. So I had to yep. sit here. I could look at the jury here in front of me, the judge who was on the right-hand side uh, and on my left-hand side with the prosecution, his team, our team, you know, and he was in the big perspex glass cage in the back of the room. The, the the courtroom was packed. There was press everywhere. There was like standing room only and it was absolutely packed. Um, so I did what I was told. I didn't look at him. Um, I had the jury laughing because I had to talk about my underpants that I was wearing, you know, and why he couldn't feel them when he stuck his hand up my shorts. Um, I uh, At the very end of everything, um, his lawyer doing her job called me a liar and I'd just been so open uh, and, and authentic, which is who I am as a pe person, and I was so shocked to be called a liar because I'm so gobsmackingly honest uh, that uh, the emotions just came out of me and I snorted with derision and I was just gobsmacked. And then the emotions that I'd kept down and kept in control started coming up and I started getting angry and I started getting upset. And it was time for me to leave the stand. And when I stepped off that stand, I looked at him in that glass cage and no one else. And I glared at him the, um, as I walked down the aisle. I looked at no one. I wasn't conscious of anything. This was so not deliberate. I was just, I was spinning. <laughs> um, he turned his entire body away from me. Right. On the chair that he was in, he did everything. He did not look at me once. The press was sitting behind it. My girlfriend was watching this. That guy, <laughs> the press was sitting behind him having a field day as I stalked out of the, out of the, out of the courtroom. Now the courtroom doors are like this thick, right? And there was two of them. And I, and I was kind of smuggled in because I was smuggled in everywhere. So the press couldn't see me. And I thought that they were heavy and I got quite a momentum, right? Getting out of the courtroom. My girlfriend was sitting here on the left. I grabbed my bag and went, let's go. And I pushed through the doors really hard and they went, swung really easy, went bang. I was like, dry. I pushed out of the courtroom and everybody in the court was like, oh, Susie Dent has left the building. It's like, wow. <laughs> I got out there and one of the cops comes running after me because I'm about to lose it. Like I'm about to burst into tears, you know. He grabs me, takes me to a room, guides me to this room. I sit there, the tears are coming. I'm swearing I'm not an effing liar. And, and you know, and there, all these cops are there and they're all supportive. And then, so I'm chilled out. Someone gives me a cup of tea. I'm starting to breathe. And then the man um, who I first contacted, who was in charge of the whole Operation New Tree, who had done the most amazing things, comes in, stood in front of me and took my hand. And he said, Susie, he said, I was so proud of you. You've just done the most amazing thing and well done. And I was sitting there, I'm emotional now, you can see. It was just like, oh, I was like, wow, okay, awesome. I did a good job. That's great. <laughs> awesome. And uh, then that night I saw those headlines. And it was all very positive and I was I was portrayed as the strongest witness for the prosecution. I was there for the other witnesses. I just thought if you guys are at home and you can see this, I hope that it empowers you because I'm here for you and we're all in this together. And that's what it was like. And then, uh, yeah, and then over the next, being found the next day by the BBC um, was interesting. I eventually got lied to by her while she was being manipulative. She told me about a week later that my my name had been released in court because they called me SD for Susie Dent, so, you know, up there for thinking. Um, and uh, she found me because, I guess, my CV is online and he's on my CV. So it wasn't hard. She found me. Um, and then after that, uh, about a week, I think five days after she found me, for the next two weeks, 30 other 
people found me from around the world, whether they were magazines, newspapers, radio stations or TV and news stations, they found me. I got used to saying as soon as I picked up the phone, is this call being recorded? Um, I got used to being um, careful, careful. Um, I was, uh, when I um, when I was at home, before I'd actually uh, got, knew that I was going to the UK, that letter that uh, I emailed to the judge, I'm, I'm at home and I'm going to change my pyjamas, right? And the news was on and I heard these words. I'm thinking, hang on, all right, that, that, I said that. I look up and there's a split screen and there's my words on the right-hand side of the screen going up, my whole email to the judge. And on the left-hand side, there's this male newsreader reading my words. And I've got to say, I burst out laughing. I was like, whoa! <laughs> Firstly, the first thing I thought was, oh, I'm so glad I wrote a really good email. So <laughs> that was succinct. The second thing was, wow, how did you get my email? And the third thing was the realisation that I was public property now, that everything I said and did was part of public record, that I had to be careful with how I moved through life um, while I was part of this case um, and afterwards. So I was really, really aware that, I don't know how they got my email, but they got it. And so it was uh, amazing to be chosen because of the strength of that. It was uh, amazing to be part of, of this case, uh, which became the beginning of the Me Too movement, which the hashtag was uh, coined in 2017, even though it started much earlier um, uh, with Tarana Burke in, in the States. So Alyssa Milano was the one who, who shared the hashtag. And then all of us are now part of the biggest movement in the world for women worldwide that is affecting change and it's encouraging other women to step up and come forward and share their stories and and it support their sisters you know um and that's what we're seeing and we're seeing historical cases and we're seeing mass healing of women and men around the world we've seen cardinals go down because men have come forward we have people standing up for themselves and um getting rid of the and healing their their children children and their inner souls so that they can become the person that they're supposed to be. Um, I'm so lucky I've been, um, I'm a speaker now uh, and I've been around the world talking about this and um, it's quite, uh, it's amazing to be able to encourage others to tell their story and to help them um, with their bravery to do so, you know. And um, that all came about because of the second thing that happened, didn't it, Tracy? Yes, yes. So tell. So I want. I want to just kind of recap some of this, Suze, because it's such like so empowering what has happened with your what you did as far as like taking action, and listening to that um, to that little girl inside of you saying, "No, enough is enough. You have to do something about that." But then you see, and one of your sisters out there who you didn't even know, like going through the same experience and going, "Hang on a minute, I'm not alone. Gosh, this has actually happened to somebody else." <gasps> And I, and I have to, I just am compelled now to have to stand beside her and help her deal with the situation. Because if it's yeah. happened to me, and it's happened to her, oh my gosh, it has probably happened to hundreds and hundreds of other young girls because he was an extremely, um, uh, you know, popular back in that day so he had ex had exposure to many many young young people so being able to actually take a stand like stand up for what you believed in stand firm on what you believed in go to the court speak your truth and then walk out of there hand in you know it, it with your even though you know literally you weren't there with this other, these other women arm and arm but you were figuratively like you were there with them all together all tackling this thing together and that is actually this me too movement and the stuff that we're talking about is about sharing these stories it is about taking a stand realizing that hey hang on a minute the things that actually happened to me you said you know that this stuff i started to believe that it was a me problem it wasn't a, and now you realize it wasn't a you problem it, you know it wasn't your problem at all but until we can disassociate ourselves with being the problem the healing can't begin so you so you understanding that that's the case and now sharing your story today for those women that are out there that are carrying something that has impacted their changed the trajectory of their life changed the narratives that have been going on or replaying in their heads over and over and over again the story that you have today enables them to say there is some, I can make a difference here. And the person that's in control of this, it's not that somebody else. It's not waiting for, you know, some someone to turn up and solve your problems. It's within. 
and you can ch- make those changes to d- start making those changes today and start taking action to change and forgive and be able to um, release yourself from those burdens to be able to move on and realize that they are simply just she myths and you do not need to accept them or hang on to them any longer. So that's what I want to say about the story that you've got. I know that there's like there's a second kind of part to the story and, and we're we're like right almost I want to be um, respectful of your time because we're nearly on an hour and obviously for our viewers too there's a there's a second part to the story and we can tell it now Suze or because it's such an impactful thing I actually would love to have you back on so we can actually do this in two segments now now that we've kind of talked through all of this I think the next one actually warrants an entire session on its own so guys there is a second part to this and it's really and it's it's actually moving on from the situation that Susie has had um, and I'm going to say that she I don't want to tell all of the story now because it's such a good one but how she's actually moved on taken all of those experiences that she's had in her life listen to that girl that 12 year old girl and made some significant changes to go on I'm going to say to be a beauty queen um, and that I'm um, my friends is where I want to leave it today because I don't want to give the rest of that story away and um, what I do want to say is if you want to go back and you want to see some of the I mean it's out there in public domain now like as Susie said it, it's it's nothing to hide um, the whole Ralph uh, Harris thing is out there you guys can go and look at it go and follow Susie on her um, on her uh, social media sites but in the next segment um, if she's willing to come back I'd love to go down the path of like what it was that she actually did to get herself from being really almost self-destructive and not um, you know not accepting the body that she had to then being really accepting everything that she is to then go on and be um, and to to be a beauty queen and if you hang around you know we get the next I'll come back to you and let you know what date that's going to be because I'll have to work with her but when we get to that point you'll see exactly what she did and it's super inspirational where she's gone to from here so is that all right with you Suze because it's yeah it's that'd be lovely thank you Let's continue that but I want definitely to definitely part two this. isn't it <laughs> this is definitely a a serial there's there's uh there's more to the story and it gets better and better as uh, as it goes on so i want to have you back um and probably if we can i'll get uh, our producer to be in contact with you and just organize the time but i want to say to you thank you so much and thank you for like standing up and standing firm on what you believe in and actually making a difference and doing all the things that you are doing now with that 12 year old girl inside of you that's saying susie this is a thing that you have to do you have to speak up you have to speak the truth and empowering other women to do the same thing so thank you so much for being here today and sharing so um openly your story to inspire other women to move forward in a really positive and empowering way oh you're most welcome thank you so much for having me thank you everybody for listening i hope you enjoyed my story if any of you want to reach out just to have a chat about your experiences i'm here for you um i'd love to hear from you and uh, I'll, I'll see everybody on facebook and i'll get to see you guys next time for part two the yes. empowerment we will definitely have sequence, sequence number two, which is going to be the empowerment piece. So you have to tune in for that because it's 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 a good story. So Susie, where's the best place that they can uh, they can connect with you? Facebook. Go to Susie. Yeah, Dent. Facebook is good. Susie Dent Facebook or Susie Dent MC. You can just find me. S U Z I D E N T. There you go, guys. If you want to connect with Susie, head on over to Facebook and find her there. But she will be back on the Take a Stand show again. I will let you know what date that is going to be. But we will have part two of the series and make sure that you get the full story so that you too can go on and do the th- do wonderful things with your life regardless of what's happened in your past. So thank you so much for, for joining me, Susie. You're always a pleasure to talk with, full of energy and um and enthusiasm for life and I just love the person that you are today so thank you for being here I want to thank everybody else for watching today's show join me again on another episode of Take a Stand where we continue to share inspirational motivational and heartfelt stories from women from all over the world 
just so that you too can feel like you are well supported, you are not standing alone, that you can actually stand up and make a real difference in this world. So I want to say thank you very much for joining today and I will see you again next Thursday at 10 a.m. Brisbane time for another episode, which is live by the way, of Take a Stand. I'm your host Tracy Wilson. Thanks for joining me and bye for now.